Um, actually, to start with you, Laura, um, what are the mistakes you made in your recruitment processes, and how have you changed them? Um, mistakes, I guess, yeah. We made. I think. I think we continue to make them. Just hopefully, just less mistakes that we were making before. Uh, so I guess one of the uh, most obvious ones is just um, being, just taking the easy route and just hiring from the circle, the small circles of people you know. So if you have three or four developers and then you say, hey, let's grow the team, then try, just reach out to your contacts on Twitter. Uh, you're going to perpetuate whatever um, diversity or non-diversity you have in your team. So that's, that's sort of what happened to us initially. We just didn't really notice. It, it was just the team needed to grow, and that's how we did it. Um, I guess also, if you have uh, any rules that are in place that just seem to be there for no reason, so like this is how we hire, uh, and it's not giving results, uh, I guess it's it, one, one thing that, that helped us was just challenging and just asking why. Okay, why do we do things this way? Why don't we try this other thing? Because uh, if, we, if, if we're not pleased with the results that we're getting, let's just try something else. So sometimes there's that mismatch with wanting to get different results but not really wanting to change the process. So uh, I guess, yeah, challenging anything that doesn't seem to be working and just trying something new. The, the new thing might not work better, uh, but it's, it's worth a shot if what the process that you have is not really giving you what you want. What kind of new things have you tried? Um, so, uh, well, how we've worked uh, with makers this year, we hired uh, three new contractors, which is something we'd never, uh, we'd never done before. I mean, hiring a sort of junior contractor, so to speak, just to give it a, uh, a label. We, we'd never done that, um, and it's, uh, it took some convincing uh, in, in the team, but we, we tried out, and we have uh, three new developers, and they're doing great. And uh, so, yeah, that, that, that did challenge some of the old rules, and we did have to... Uh, scratch our heads to see how it would we would make that work, uh, just paperwork wise, I guess. Uh, but it's it's worked out really really well. So yeah, that's one of the things. Yeah. Um, let's move on on the other spectrum, Chris. Um, so we talked about inclusivity and diversity. It's a big agenda. It's something we really care about. We have had cohorts made of uh, up to 50, 52 percent women. I guess the tricky question that we see all the time is how do you balance that desire for diversity and inclusivity with, well, first, for fundamentally your engineering needs and your search for candidates? And how do you balance that trickiness as at times, you know, how, how do you define it, do you not define it, and, and how do you go about it, basically? Um, that's a very good question, and I don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a sort of an easy answer. I mean, the, the most important thing for me was um, was recognizing that there was a problem in the first place, and recognizing that we had, for our, our existing um, ways of hiring, we were we had huge um, gender bias issues, and we had you know we had we had class, class, race, gender, all the biases, and it was it was something that wasn't there explicitly. It was just um, to your point about your list of hundred hundred CVs. You look at it and think, what have the, what have these CVs all got in common? Oh, they, you know, it's exactly the same kind of um, sort of profile. So I think the first thing was to explicitly say. We think this is this lack of diversity is harmful to our team, so we are going to actively hire. Um, in the first place, so we ac actively hire some female developers and actively hire some non-white developers. Um, so we just we said we're going to we're going to do this. We hold everyone who applies has to has to um, do the same engineering test. Um, uh, but even in the engineering test, and this is a, a problem I think we have now because we don't anonymize the engineering test. I I think there is probably still some unconscious bias in the way the engineering test is uh, um, is scored. So I think it's so the, my first point is to say is to recognise that those those biases are there, um, and even if they're even if they're you know they're by their nature they're they're. they're then they don't sort of jump out and you see them. You've, you've, got, you've just got to acknowledge that they're there. Um, and then the second point would be to see whether in what your your criteria for selecting people, whether you're being too reductionist, whether you're just sort of saying, actually, they've, the, only, the only thing that matters is a high score on the technical test. Um, are, there, are there other qualities that you're missing? So communication is the, is the absolutely key one. And when we do, our, when we, when we do the weighting for the, the scoring of our technical test, if it's coming from makers, we actually weigh the communication part of the, the technical test higher. Um, and we actually get, we find it something that the makers, people who hire from makers just do really, really well. They kind of, I think it's probably 
to do with coming from out of other disciplines, other other careers, where you know, if you if you don't get the communication piece right, it, you know, collaboration doesn't work and, and, and such like. So, um, is that yeah? And how, how do you how do you impart that knowledge to the rest of your team? Because I mean, as a CTO, you don't do like every part of the recruitment. No. So it was. Um, it was the the test was was kind of written collaboratively, so I did a first version of it, and that was ripped up by one of our developers and, and written again, and then we sort of back and forth that a bit, and then another developer came up with our um, our scoring matrix, so came up with these are the things that we're looking for, this is how we weigh them, that sort of thing, and then because we get <laughs> when we come to makers, we get such a fantastic response, we get like you know twenty or thirty. Um, uh, people to um, to review, and we try. We we aim to turn it around in a week, so we just do, we divvy it up across the whole group and say, everyone, please take you know five people from the list um, and and go and go through the process. I say the next step we have to, we've got to anonymise that though because it's and um Andy, you can keep the microphone. Um, so as I said at the mini at the beginning, you spend a heck of a lot of time jumping into companies. Often when you come into a company that needs they need help. I guess you can flip the same question on, in, in two ways. What is one of the common mistakes you see companies and CTOs and lead engineers make uh, over the years in terms of the engineering practice or tech recruitment? Um, or you flip it and you say, if you had to summarize one thing that you go and fix in company, what would that be? The magic bullet. <laughs> um, I'd say probably the biggest mistake that I see people make, especially as they're going through um, the, the initial phases of their startup business is um, feeling, uh, feeling that they have to hire too quickly. There's a lot of pressure from other parts of the business to build a technology team at a higher rate of growth than is really healthy. So they neglect things like the culture, they neglect the practices, they neglect the um, diversity of, their, of applicants and so on and so forth. And that's something something that makes it harder to turn around further on down the line um, so in in a lot of companies that i work with where they're just coming through a series a or a um or a, a high seed round um, i suggest that they hold fire and they don't hire as fast as they they think they need to um, and be a bit more uh, a bit more um selective um yeah okay um and so, 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 okay, you come in, what, can you describe a scenario when you come into a company, what are the, the three top line questions that you'd ask in order to identify where, they're, where the bottlenecks or needs are? Specifically with the culture and the team or with practices? Or both, I guess. Both. Um, so I'd, I'd look to see whether people are actually happy there, whether they're enjoying working on the, the code base. Um, that's pretty easy to find out by um, talking to developers, strangely enough. Do you enjoy working on the code you're working on? How, how often are you um, dreading coming into work? How often are you um, fighting with somebody else on the team? How collaborative is it? Um, how, uh, how friendly are the people you work with? Um, because a, a, good, uh, a good guide for the, the quality of life for developers on the team and the culture and, the, and uh, so on and so forth um, it, it reflects on the, the quality of the code they're working on, the quality of the practices they, they adopt, um, and, uh, and so on. And so do you apply a certain set of typical practices for all of the companies? Is it, is it a one-size-fits-all model? No, they, they tend to all have different problems. So we have a, a set of tools that we commonly use to, um, to, to get them uh, to start to make changes, but they're, they're more commonly coaching tools and mentoring tools rather than specific agile methodologies or, um, or development methodologies. So it's, it's a, a means of getting them to identify problems in the way they do things and start to, start to build their own talents, start to build their own skills. Cool, thank you. Dom, um, question for you is, which we see all the time, is like, how do you find, how do you strike a balance between, well, you know, I have to deliver value right now, and I'm not entirely sure or, um, whether I have the resources to take on, on a junior talent or somebody that I'll mentor. So how do you find that striking balance? How do you know when, or another way to phrase it is, how do you know when's the right time to take somebody that you can mentor? And is there a right time? Or actually from day one, if you have one senior, is already the right time? Uh, I get the hard question then. Um, uh, I don't know, actually, is a short answer. Um, but what you do need is, is balance throughout 
your your dev team, and that's what we found um, for sure. Um, whether that's diversity in gender or race or background um, or experience. Or experience. Uh, in fact, we don't we don't label our developers junior, senior, intermediate. Um, second, you label someone, they feel either less involved or um, less open to communication. And communication is the key to delivering value for any company. Okay. So you, you, how many of the developers have you got in your team right now? So that's the rub. We're quite small. So we, I mean, your, your team is big in, in our world. We've got 20 so far, uh, but we started with no one. And we've slowly built up and we've taken some of the advice that's given, not building up too quickly. It's a careful process for us. It's a long process for us. Um, and we don't, we don't put strange stress on our hiring process for the candidates either. So. And when did you hire your first non, not to label it senior? Oh, very ex oh, experienced developer. Do you remember when that was? How big were you at that point? Uh, that was right at the beginning. Okay, so you took the risk right at the beginning. Didn't see it as a risk. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So that, that's the bit that I'm interested in. Why did you at that point say, it doesn't matter if we have Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was a conscious decision. I think it was just we, we got candidates in and we looked at them and they, they were people that we'd like to work with. Um, and they, you know, they proved themselves in a way that we felt that they would, would be good for the company and good for the rest of the team. Um, there was a question that was um, asked by, by, by the audience around um, the recruitment process feel fairly lengthy and start with a technical test that is uh, a a two-hour take-at-home test. Um, the, the person asking the question said it's, it feels like it's putting the candidates off. Uh, how can we effectively assess the ability in a shorter and more attractive way? Was that our test specifically or just any test? Um, uh, well, I would say that uh, any test that we give, um, we don't put a time constraint on it. So we just say, here's the test. Um, it, it reflects our culture of what we want developers to be around. Um, there's no, you know, we try and reduce the number of requirements for things like frameworks or technologies. Um, and we say, when you're ready, come back to us. Um, some people turn it around two hours, some people take two weeks. They might be on holiday. They might have you know, work to do and things like that. So. And have you found that this was a blocker? This, does, does this stop people from applying? Are you, are you, are, do you get dropout at that point? No, I think we get some kickback from um, the recruitment systems. Um, and you know, I apologize if there's any recruiters in the, in the room, but they're, all, um, they're not all the same and some are better at it than others. Um, the candidates will do it or they won't. And some people go, no, I don't want to do it. And you go, okay, that's fine, no problem. Um, and if they come back, and some people will give it up before it's ready and say, is this what you want? And we'll say, yeah, we'll, we'll grade it and have a look. And then go back and say, oh, it was a little bit scrappy. Can you clean it up over here? If they want feedback, they'll get it. That's normal. So, that's so length of test has no uh, correlation with uh, people applying or not applying for, for your work. For. So um, I don't want to take too much of your, your, your time, and I'd love to open up for questions from the public. So who wants to be the first one? So it's the hardest. Who wants to be the first one to ask a question to anybody? Um, so my question is, um, have you been tempted to lower the bar because there's such um, a short, uh, there's such a high demand for developers? And if you have, what has been the effect on your team? Yeah, it's uh, the lowering the bar uh, thing. It's, uh, it's always uh, funny when I hear it because it's, uh, I've heard it a, a lot before. So it's like, oh, I'm not lowering the bar to get more diversity. We're going to get diversity some other way. Uh, not really in Financial Times, but other places where I've worked. And it's not really about lowering the bar. Uh, it's just about uh, sort of broadening the pool of where you, where you get your candidates. Uh, we've never had to uh, hire anyone who did, uh, less, who did worse than someone else uh, just to uh, improve our diversity numbers. We've never had to do that, and I don't think we'll, never, we'll ever need to do that. It's just uh, if, if, you, if you're sort of uh, looking 
for candidates in a in like sort of outside the box. You're you're like like I was saying before. If you're not pleased with the candidates that you're getting in, then just look somewhere else. Uh, and there's there's really good candidates out there. It's uh it's it is diverse out there. It's just about where we look and just not uh, go into the sort of the common and comfortable places or just listening to the loudest voices. It's just uh, just thinking outside the box. But, but yeah, in in terms of the lowering the bar, the bar, we've we've never had to do it. We were increasing diversity without having to do it, and I don't think it's even I don't think it's even related. It's uh it's if if at some point in your process uh, you come to the place where you think maybe I need to lower the bar, it's just stop and think. It's it's not about lowering the bar. It's about you know uh, looking looking elsewhere for candidates, I guess. Uh, yeah, I don't think we have either. We're, again, we're, t we're quite small. Maybe get to your numbers or sort of people you've worked with. It, it might be something we have to resist, but um, it's important not to. Um, and that generally means taking a lot longer. Um, and it has it takes us a, a great deal of time to find the right people. So um, it's only fair to both the company and the people you've hired before and everyone not to to uh, to sort of throw in. Uh, the wrong sort of mix. So. Let me um, turn the question around. What, what are some reasons that you might think you would need to lower the bar? Well, because you've got a client on your back saying you need to get this done, you know, in the next two weeks. Okay. That's, that's a reasonable reason. Um, I guess uh, in that specific situation, what I'd be more inclined to do is turn it around and say to them, look, uh, the only method we have of achieving these timelines is by dropping the quality uh, of the search of the uh, people we bring in, but also potentially of the product we deliver. Um, can we negotiate on scope? Can we negotiate on time scale um, and negotiate that way? I'm, I'm very loath to, to drop the quality of either code or people that I bring into my teams. Um, and I'd much rather be upfront and negotiate with people about the effects of doing that personally. So rather than sort of visualizing it as a bar, I'd visualize it as a radar diagram with various different um, aspects of, of, of the, the capabilities that, that we need. One of them is, is uh, ability with a specific programming language. One of them is communication. Another one is um, empathy, um, the various ones. Um, and what we found when hiring through traditional sort of recruiter routes is that radar diagram would be very skewed over on one side and not on the other. And we did exactly as you did, looked, started looking elsewhere. That's when we, start, we, we came to Makers and said, okay, so if we try hiring from different constituencies and we start saying, well, we've got, if, we, if, our, if our skew is over on the technical side, but maybe we're weak on comms or we're weak on empathy or we're weak on kind of, um, you know, um, <sighs> Well, let's leave those two. Then, why don't we look elsewhere and see if and see and see if it we sort of address that? And this is exactly what we did. And it's a really a really sort of good test for me in the when we get the test back from our makers um, candidates is they do killer readmes, they really really good readmes that really show a real an understanding of the problem, um, a desire to show they're working, talk about what they're doing, things like that. And that's um, you know that's that makes a huge difference. I also think that. TD, TDD being a core practice of makers is, re is really, really important. And that's, a, and that's for me, I firmly believe that you cannot develop modern, quality modern software without TDD. It's just it's a foundational practice for me. And it's, it's a practice that, so if I was going to set, set a, a sort of a bar in terms of the, t the technology point, I have to, that's, a, that's something that is really that's part of the culture as well, saying, no, TDD is a core practice. And if you don't, if you're not been exposed to it before, you don't know it. But maybe you're you know a load of other great things about other aspects of stuff, and you and you want to learn it, then you know we we may take you on the journey with us. But so to sort of come back around and answer your question properly. It's really I would I would not look at it as a bar. I'd look at it as as being multidimensional, and then look at kind of how do you if you you may have some people who are skewed in one direction and 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 others in another. But if you've got a team that works together and collaborates, and they, they'll all level up in, in all of those facets. Cool. Let's do last question. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, technical interviewing, 
Um, how much uh, importance would you place on things like CS fundamentals, data structures, and so on? Depends on the uh, platform, depends on the product, right? If you, if you have a product that relies on being able to optimize to the nth degree uh, for whatever reason, for performance, or um, if it's uh, a high-speed a high uh, trading algorithm or something like that, and those kind of skills are really important. Um, where they're more useful if you're not in that environment uh, is in testing problem-solving skills. This, this is what it all, all comes down to to me. If you can see a problem and define an algorithmic solution in some way, whether or not it uses what you learned in your computer science degree, then, um, then that's a great way of spotting someone who knows what they're doing. Yeah, if I was going to rely on the, what I learned in my computer science degree, it would be Pascal and C, which would not, not be a great fit for I was just a, just a little joke. But um, I think I would echo what the, what's just been said there. It's about um, making the test fit. And this really goes back to your point at the beginning. If the test doesn't fit the, kind of the work you're actually going to be doing and the, and, and the culture, then it's not, it's not really a very good test and it's not going to do a very good job of, of, sort of, of attracting uh, the right people. We just we, we the typical startup. We we're, we're actually a smaller team than, than you. We're only about twelve people, and we started with all all generalists, and we've just started to specialise. So as we've started to specialise, we've introduced more more specialist tests, and so specifically around operations. So our operations test was, you know, spin spin this load balance pair of Node.js servers up in AWS. We don't care what tooling you use to do it, but go do it. Um, and that was you know we hired a great um, tech sort of operations person from that. Something or no? Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. That's uh, a first in a series uh, of events. Um, there's still a lot of food that needs to be go gone from our delicatessen across the road, who did it with love this morning. So, so definitely, please take one. Uh, feel free to hang around. We've got the space, and uh, there's a team around with all the red badges, and there's. All of you, there's so much stuff to learn, and, and the idea is next time we'll do, based on the feedback you provide, we'll in, improve, make it even better. Because the, the simple idea is as there is so much knowledge, and as, as you saw, there are so many different recruitment processes, and, and, and what I find is that everybody's in, again, their own bubble. And once we sort of bring everybody together, and there's not just a meetup about Java or, or a meetup about uh, recruiters and finding the talent, but rather about the meta, which is how do you go about doing the job well, I think we'll be able to to all be much better in trying to solve, or solve a problem which is going to get more challenging uh, in the next couple of years. So thank you very much for your time and a round of applause for everybody. Woo!